and we're super excited to have uh, Sophie Wong here today. So a little bit about her, she's a designer, a maker and a writer, and she specializes in wearable technology and, and making. And she's been featured in um, Hackspace and Make Magazine, as, along with uh, Adam Savage's Tested.com, and has done work for uh, Seattle Opera. So we're super excited to hear more about your process and your work. And again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to put it in the chat, and we'll have a little question and answer time um, at the end. Um, but Without further ado, Sophie, uh, welcome, and the stage is yours uh, when you're ready. Great, thanks so much. Oh, actually, I'm gonna just stop share and say hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to this talk. And uh, yeah, I'm Sophie Wong. I'm a designer and a maker. I'm based in Seattle, Washington. Um, my background is really in design. I'm a, I studied graphic design in school but I really had a holistic um, okay? experience in I learning so. design. Oh, excuse me. Can you hear me? Okay. Great, okay. Okay, awesome. So my background's really in graphic design, but my professors exposed us to a lot of different kinds of design and we really learned design as a framework for approaching any problem and um, using design to navigate to, toward a solution for anything that you wanna solve. So I took the idea of, of design and I just apply it to everything that I wanna do. I've done costuming, I've done fashion design, and now I do a lot of wearable technology. So. Now I'm gonna pop up my screen so you can see my presentation. There we go. So, oops, there we go. So this is kind of what a lot of my work ends up looking like. I, I'm really inspired by uh, fantasy and science fiction and I create things sometimes that are purely aesthetic. Sometimes I create things that have a function or are interactive. Um, but this is an example of something that I made that is really for aesthetic purposes. It's really more of an art piece. This is an LED manicure. And uh, I took that idea a little further and made uh, an RGB version. Um, these are all programmable, individually addressable RGB LEDs that I've connected to nails uh, to make sort of an LED manicure. This is an LED jacket that uses 3D printed diffusers that I apply to the back of the jacket. So again, this is also programmable. And this is a sound sampling glove. So I can load any kind of sound onto this glove. And then I added some conductive points to the fingers. So when I bring the fingers together, it plays a sound. And I don't think you'll be able to hear it when I play this video for you, but um, pretend it's meowing. Meow, 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 meow. That's basically what it sounds like. Uh, and it's not actually a cat meowing, it's literally me saying meow. But you can load that up with any sound you like, and I just love cats, so it's a meowing glove. This is a wearable game controller hoodie that I made, and I just had this idea to create an immersive way to play Flappy Bird. So uh, I created this hoodie, I, I kind of turned it into a costume by adding all those feathers, but I added also some conductive fabric under the arm. And when you flap your arms like a bird, it makes your in-game bird fly. So it's kind of fun, a different way to play Flappy Bird. Obviously you look really cool when you're doing this. Um, and it's a pretty simple project, but you know, the, the impact is there because I took it a little further and, and turned it into a costume. So you might be thinking like, is that wearable tech? You know, I thought wearable tech was fitness trackers and smartwatches and you know VR headsets. And yes, these things are consumer examples of wearable tech that a lot of people are familiar with now, but it's actually a very narrow slice of 
what is out there in terms of wearable technology today. Wearable technology can also look like this. This is an amazing cosplay by my friend Alina Granville. And um, she, she actually designed and build, built her own 3D printer. She designed and built it from scratch in order to accomplish this costume. It is all 3D printed. Uh, there are lights in it. There's even smoke in it. She designed and built this smoking device, this vapor device to create this smoke effect, which is now a product that she sells and it's incredible. And, and this comes from the world of cosplay, but this is absolutely wearable technology. A lot of fashion designers are working in wearable technology now as well, and they are making incredible garments and they're using LEDs and electronics and servo motors and 3D printing and just really innovative uh, fabrication processes. So um, wearable technology, it can either, it can include technology in the finished piece or it can also just use technology and in innovative emerging technology heavily in the fabrication process. So these are all examples of wearable technology and I like to have a really broad definition of wearable technology because I think that gives us the most useful material to learn from, examples to learn from, and all of these examples, all of these projects and devices, they all have to solve for a common problem. The constant is the human body. So whether you're building a smartwatch or a wearable game controller or a tattoo that has some kind of interactivity built into it or a medical device, you're gonna have to figure out how that's gonna go on the body, how it's gonna be comfortable, how it's gonna come off the body, how you're gonna power it, how you're gonna clean it. All of these problems and complexities that come out of any wearable device, you have to solve that whether you're sewing an LED into a t-shirt or building the next version of the HoloLens. What's really exciting about working in this field right now is you don't need to be an industry professional to dabble with this stuff and to tinker with this stuff. A lot, there's so much uh, interest in this field uh, that, that, that companies that make electronic components are actually creating specific components and specific microcontrollers for wearables. So this is an image of several different types of microcontrollers and components. There's LEDs, there's sensors, there's battery packs. <clears throat> and these are all specifically designed for wearables. So they have rounded edges, they're flat on the back, so nothing is gonna poke you if you stick this onto a garment. It's not gonna destroy the fabric. A lot of these can be sewn to rather than soldered to. So you can create your circuit with conductive thread, which is more flexible. Uh, so it's amazing what you can make with the components that you can buy today. And these are all available to anyone who can afford them on the internet. And then there are these machines. These are the machines that I have that I use in my fabrication process. So 3D printers, desktop CNC mill, a laser cutter. And again, these are examples of technology that previously you needed to really be in industry to have access and to gain the knowledge to use these machines. But now you can buy these and have them in your home. So it's making all of this technology available to more and more people, we're getting more diversity in terms of who is designing and building wearable technology. And it's just super exciting. And I'm thrilled to just be in the mix contributing to it. Um, and then I've listed some of the software on the right there that I use. And a lot of this software, some of it is free. I have, my background is in graphic design, so I am firmly entrenched in the Adobe Creative Suite. But there are free versions of this type of software available. So you could get Inkscape if you don't want to do Illustrator. You can, um, you can try FreeCAD if you don't want to use Fusion 360 
in a, in a paid model. Um, a lot of the software is available uh, as free as well. And there are huge communities developing around this software, explaining to people how to get into it, how to use it if you're new. Um, and it's just amazing. So these are two examples of things that I've recently built using some of this technology that I've, that I've just shown you. Um, and I'm gonna talk about these two projects and my process for these projects today. Um, that's my spacesuit on the left, and on the right is a 3D printed dress that I'm currently working on. So let's start with my spacesuit. So this is a, it's a conceptual spacesuit. It's a costume. I love costumes, I love building costumes. And I love thinking as a costume designer. So I really wanted my own spacesuit and I really wanted to design it from scratch. So that's what this project is. But when I say spacesuit, I think a lot of people think of this. These are NASA spacesuits, these are functional, real spacesuits that have been used in space. On the left is the current one that they use for, um, for EVAs. And on the right is the A7L. It was used in the Apollo missions. It's super iconic. And um, you know, these are kind of what people have in mind when they say, I built my own spacesuit, but I didn't build a spacesuit for going to space. You know, I built a costume. So mine looks very different. And I was inspired by, uh, as much as I love the NASA, spacesuits. I was really more inspired by fantasy spacesuits. I love sci-fi and this kind of image is really what I wanted to have. I wanted this to be my experience in my spacesuit. And so I, I start all my projects with inspiration. So I gathered a whole bunch of images from fantasy uh, sci-fi space movies that really um, that really spoke to me. And this theme emerged among them. I realized that I loved the space helmet with the lights inside shining on the person's face. Super cinematic, does not make sense because it doesn't work in real life. If you have lights shining inside the helmet, it creates a glare on the inside and you can't really see out from it. They do it in Hollywood because it looks great and it actually reduces a lot of the glare from the outside so it reduces some camera reflection but you don't want to do this in an actual functional spacesuit i wanted to do it because i wanted to look badass like that so i started with the helmet and i'm kind of a scrappy builder so i started with a costume helmet that already existed but I decided I wanted to push this helmet as far away from its original look as possible. And I, I thought that I could do it with the use of my laser cutter and um, some, some design, some clever design choices. So I started by patterning off of the actual helmet. And this is a, a cosplay technique of using blue tape to capture the shape, the contour of the physical object. I drew the shapes that I wanted to make. I cut them out. And then I scan them into my computer and I digitize them in Illustrator. So here's the raw scan. Here is what I turned it into in Illustrator. These are vector shapes that I could then cut on my laser cutter. And the material I'm using here is EVA foam. It's basically yoga mat material. It's very easy to work with. It's heat formable. It's very light. And it's, again, a really common um, cosplay material and costuming material. Um, and you can do things like you can cut completely through it like I'm doing here. You can etch into it. So I've got some etched lines in there. And I basically just created these shapes out of foam and started adding them to the helmet, masking the areas I didn't like. I didn't like that wavy area around the neck, so I covered that up. I love that egg shape around the head, so I really tried to pop that and um, added a whole bunch of different textures that I could create all out of the same material using my laser cutter. So I etched in that hexagon pattern. I etched in the, those ring shapes to make them kind of look like some mechanical component. Um, and I created that, that uh, trim that has those like uh, vertical lines. And I used that to kind of create some contour lines on the helmet. And this is all the same material. Hitting it with primer is like the magic moment where it all starts to turn into something else. And uh, I knew I couldn't change the color of the visor. The visor, like I said, I started with that costume helmet. It was blue. There's nothing I could do about the color of the visor. So I decided I was gonna play that up and make blue the hero color for the entire suit. So it would look 
intentional. And then I didn't have to do anything about the visor. It just looked like it was supposed to be blue. So I used blue as the base color for the entire suit. Had to get the electronics in there because that was the whole point. I really wanted the light. Uh, I also added some lights shining outward from the side of the helmet and I wanted those to be sound reactive. So I also have a microphone on the inside. And this is again, the use of those uh, components. This, this is um, called a NeoPixel from Adafruit. Adafruit makes these very easy to use individually addressable LEDs that I love to use in my work. This is another strip of those NeoPixels and these are the lights that are shining on my face on the inside of the helmet. I created these diffusers for those outside lights and I just made these out of hot glue. Uh, I created a mold out of some found object in my house and then I just filled that mold with hot glue and hot glue diffuses light really beautifully. So I just use those as my diffusers. I painted them up to look like metal, but they still retain that diffusion quality. And once you start finding things in your house that look like they would be perfect in your costume, it's like nothing is sacred and you will cannibalize objects in your house to make your costume perfect. So I took these little orange latches off of this case and I painted them up to look like metal and um, I thought those would be great tie downs for the the visor of my helmet. My helmet, the visor doesn't actually open anymore because I added so much to the outside of it. Um, but I wanted it to look like it still did, so I created these little tie downs on the front. Painted everything the same color and it's just like you don't know what is plastic and what is foam at that point. Tried to get a lot of different textures into it because I think that really sells a prop. And this is the finished helmet. And I think it's a pretty successful piece in terms of, um, you know, fantasy space gear. Um, and I think you might not know by looking from just looking at it that that's all the same material. It's pretty much just foam on a plastic base. Um, and so I got to this point and I was really excited. Uh, and I realized, you know, I I love this helmet so much, but I really needed a spacesuit to go with it. So um, I went back to the drawing board and I started looking at my favorite sci-fi movies and the spacesuits in them. And I was really inspired by, um, by a lot of these and particularly the, the Martian. I really like their choice of, um, I find in fantasy space movies, the spacesuits typically have two, uh, I see two trends in fantasy spacesuits. One is the very sleek, form-fitting, synthetic, stretch, uh, active wear kind of look. And then, and then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is more utilitarian, more room in there for mobility. It seems a little more practical. And so that's kind of where I was going. I didn't want to do a super form-fitted um, synthetic stretch material look. I thought it would be more practical to have more mobility in the suit. So it's uh, kind of more basing it on this kind of Martian look with equipment strapped on top. And that was basically my strategy for making the spacesuit: Some kind of util utilitarian bodysuit with equipment strapped on top. Love first contact. These spacesuits are so iconic. Uh, also, Sunshine. If you've never seen Sunshine, it's a totally wacky and underrated sci-fi movie, and they have this insane spacesuit in it. It is so bizarre, but I love it. So the gold in my spacesuit is definitely inspired by, by this one from Sunshine. So I put all my, those ideas in my brain, in the hopper, turned them around, and I came up with some just visual ideas for what my spacesuit could look like. I sewed the suit from scratch and I just tried to um, take some elements from, from the spacesuits that I'd seen. The pleating in the, in the joints is something that they do in the NASA spacesuits for mobility. And um, so I thought that would be a nice detail to add. And then on top of that, I wanted to get the equipment. And the equipment I decided I was going to build out of EVA foam try to make it match the helmet as much as possible. Um, and in the same way that I patterned my helmet off of the actual physical helmet, I patterned this off of my body. And that's how I knew it would fit. Tested it in paper. 
And again, it's the same process of digitizing the pattern, adding any kind of surface design I wanted to etch into it, cutting it out on my laser. And you can see when it comes out on the, from the laser, it's very flat. But when you close up those darts, it wraps around the body really nicely. And this is you know, a technique that I learned when I was uh, learning about apparel design. So all of those things that I've done in the past, costuming, fashion design, they're all coming into play in the projects that I do now, here and there, just little tips and tricks I've picked up over the course of making things. And I kept adding layers and detail and trying to build up dimension in the piece because as you saw, it was very flat when I put it all together and I wanted to break through um, that 2D look. I discovered that I could be very clever about hiding the seam. So I built this project pretty quickly. It was about two weeks, I think, for building the suit from scratch. And I knew I wasn't going to have time to hide any seams. So I wanted to disguise the seams in plain sight. And I realized I could use this surface pattern, the lines that I'd created, to hide the seams. So this is, I think, the best example of that. It's the last piece that I made. Um, and I wish I'd thought of this idea earlier in the process. But this is a shoulder piece. And I just cut that contour line right down the middle of the piece and it's that curve. So when I join those curves together, it curves it in that sort of parabolic shape over my shoulder. And I don't have to do anything to hide that seam because it just blends into the surface pattern because I just radiated those lines straight out from it. And that I just, I put that together and I just stood there and looked at it for a while. I was, I was so happy with that. It's a tiny piece. Nobody's going to see that, but I'm going to see it. I uh, did a lot of priming for this piece. Not too much sanding, a lot of priming though. Um, and it, here it is again, that magic moment with the gray primer is like, okay, I think I'm on the right track here. And painted it up to look like the helmet. And I finished it. And so uh, I think the pieces go together pretty well. Um, like I said, I didn't make this to go to space, but I did want to be comfortable in it here on Earth. So I added a fan to the back and it's, um, it's actually, you can kind of see I added that utility belt around the middle. I've got my battery pack on the, the side of my hip there. And those are little USB battery packs and they're powering my fan. The fan is pushing air up through a tube um, in the back of the suit into my helmet. So I'm not getting any fogging over the visor because the air is, is moving past my helmet. You can see I left those, those um, openings. There's some air vents in the costume helmet and I did not want to close those up because I knew I would need some air to circulate in there or I was going to have some fogging problems. So um, the fan is pushing the air across the visor and out of those those vents and I'm cool and dry in there um, all day at the convention. I added this little detail on the front. I just tried to put lights wherever there was space for them really. They're kind of an afterthought to be honest, but um, it's, it's fun. It's a fun challenge to figure out where you can hide a battery after you've already built the costume. Um, and this is a look at that back, sort of backpack panel and the tube is in there and it kind of just pops up underneath the helmet and pushes air into the helmet. And yeah, so I got to have my cinematic moment in this, in this piece, oops. Now this is another one where the, uh, the audio is not going to play, but you will probably be able to see, see that light flash as I'm talking. And my concept, my idea with that was if you are actually in space, maybe you've got a team of people working on the surface of a planet and you're trying to talk to each other on comms, it might be hard to see who's actually talking. So uh, I thought maybe it'd be great to have some visual indication outside of your helmet so you could see who is talking, who's who um, in that environment. So that was all done with 2D. That was all just uh, vector 2D designs cut on my laser and folded into shape after the fact. I didn't do any 3D modeling for that project. Uh, but I also do like to work in 3D. 
So this is a project where I did a lot of 3D modeling. Um, this is my 3D printed dress. And uh, oh, you can probably, see, if I'm in my tiny bubble on the screen, you can probably see it in the studio behind me. It's still in progress, um, but it's mostly done. I'm doing some internal things to it now, like working on the lining. But uh, this is, yeah, it's a 3D printed dress and it's something that I wanted to do uh, after I finished my LED jacket. So this LED jacket is, um, it's a purchased jacket and I added some lights to the back of it and then I used, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a moment because I wanna show you this sample. So this is a sample of 3D printed fabric. It's 3D printing on fabric. And I, this is a, an example of what I created for the back of that jacket. And you can see it's very, very flexible. These white hexagons are 3D printed um, shapes that I printed directly onto the fabric. And because it's this sort of cellular design, when I remove it from the print bed, it's flexible. It retains the fabric's flexibility. And it's super intriguing, really unique material. And so in my jacket, I used it as a diffuser for these lights on the back. And here's a look at the inside of the jacket. So the, I just buried them under the lining so there's no wires visible anywhere on the jacket. And here are the raw lights poking out these little holes that I cut in the back of the jacket. And when I lay, there's the pattern of the lights. When I lay this, material on top of the lights, it diffuses the lights really nicely. And uh, I use, because this is a digital process, it was very easy for me to model these uh, panels and then export these as a 2D, um, you know, basically just print this out and then use that as a template for cutting my lights, uh, cutting the holes for my lights. So I could line up the lights perfectly using this same file that I used to extrude um, my 3D print. But then this gave me ideas. I was like, wow, this is really cool. I wanna see if I can expand this idea beyond just an applique like this. Could I make an entire garment out of it? So I had to do some more, some testing. And so I started with small scale pieces to see what kind of all over pattern would work. And um, I got some really cool pieces off of my printer like this. So this is just, you know, a small piece. And you can see I've got two different um, sort of line patterns. I have a very dense pattern of lines going in one direction, and then I have a couple of lines cutting across them in the other direction. And it creates these different um, folding mechanics on different axes uh, on the, the fabric. And I thought, ah, this is really cool. I am creating some fabric dynamics that you can't really achieve uh, with traditional textile design. Um, I mean, this is, this is really exciting to me because I felt like I was making something really new. Um, I should also say that I did not invent this process. There are lots of people out there working with 3D printed um, fabric and 3D printing on fabric. You should definitely check out the work of David Shorey if you have not, because he is where I first saw this technique being used and he's got tons of experiments on his website. Um, I'll type that into the chat later. Um, definitely check him out. Um, but I decided to do my own experiments after I was inspired by others. And um, so it was trying these different shapes. So I was looking at shapes that cut all the way across um, only in one direction, larger shapes, um, some with more volume. And printing these out was really exciting. Uh, and I just kind of tried to, uh, tried to flood my studio with, with different approaches to this 3D printing on fabric, different shapes, different designs, different materials, and just, just a scattershot approach to see what could work and what would be cool. Um, and I got some really interesting things that gave me lots of ideas. This looks like a wing. I wanna come back to this at some point. Um, this one has a little more volume uh, and it has a lot of weight. So when you start adding volume to these prints, they become heavy and they drape differently than regular fabric as well. So they're really interesting. 
Uh, but I needed some direction for, for this project. So I took some visual inspiration from the Klingons from Star Trek Discovery. I, I'm always inspired by science fiction. And um, what I really liked about these is sometimes in the series, you can't really tell whether they're wearing clothes or whether it's growing out of their body. And I thought that was a really cool, um, uh, just kind of visual concept to keep in the back of my mind while I was working on this this project, which is really just an experiment and an exploration of the process. So I didn't want to get too hung up on you know visual concept or um, or too much visual meaning. I just wanted some visual uh, guidance in terms of what I was making. I'm also always really inspired by Perfume, this J-pop group. They have a lot of technology in their costumes. They do have some 3D printed components in, in um, their performance costumes. And so I had this in the back of my mind as well. And with those two visual ideas, I started mapping out and designing the, uh, the garment portion of this piece. And it's similar to what I did with the spacesuit. Um, I'm patterning, you could say I'm patterning off my body, but I really used more um, garment patterning techniques in this project because I wanted to end up with flat patterns that I could use as my basis of work in uh, my 3D modeling program. So I just had all my samples on hand while I was working on the, the actual fabric patterning process. And um, put it all together with the visual inspiration and basically ended up with a muslin, a, um, a practice garment that I could use to cut into shapes that are small enough to 3D model and 3D print on my, print, my printer. My printer is a pretty large format. It's um, 12 by 12 inches. Uh, print bed so it can print realistically up to about 11 inches square so all of my pieces have to fit within that size constraint so I had I realized that I needed to do some things that I wouldn't ordinarily do if I was just building this out of regular fabric because once you 3d print plastic onto fabric you change the properties of it it doesn't stretch the way it usually does um, even woven fabric has some stretch in it and that allows you to create curved seams. Um, you cannot really do that when you start 3D printing because you remove all of the stretch out of the material. So I had to introduce some unorthodox angles into my patterning process. And here's, you know, going from my scans that are literally pencil uh, into um, the digital world. And this is a process I do a lot in my work, taking something from the physical and digitizing it so I can use my digital fabrication processes. Here's a look at my Fusion file. Uh, so I'm modeling all this in Fusion 360 and um, it's really pushing the, the limits of how many bodies you can have in a file. Because all of these little shapes, they're an individual body in the file. Um, this is really not the way you're supposed to use Fusion 360, but you know, I'm, I'm creating a new process here. So um, Fusion 360 is the, the program that I'm comfortable with, so I had to figure out how to make it work. Um, and then here it is starting to get printed, and it's really exciting to see these pieces start to come together. Um, and this material that I'm using is PLA. It's a common 3D printing material, um, but this color is fantastic. So like I said, this is an exploration of the process, so I didn't want to add too much to it. Um, so I wanted to print it all in one color to really highlight the material design aspect. And so I, I figured that needed to be a really amazing color. So this is Wizard's Voodoo from filamentum and it's this kind of iridescent purple it's really beautiful and like i said i can only print small pieces about 10 by 10 inches square or less so i had to figure out a way to combine the pieces together and this is something that you're always going to have to do if you're creating a full body wearable using a digital fabrication technique you're limited by the size of your machine output so i realized that i could connect these pieces together using my 3d pen so i essentially cut off the um, the fabric 
right to the edge of one print, join it right up to the next print that I want to connect it to, and then tape it, flip it over, and on the back side, I just glue that fabric down um, using my 3D pen. And um, it's a very meditative, very tedious and laborious process, but, um, but it's kind of me commiserate, uh, um, uh, communing with my project, you know, at the end of the process, after all of this hands off 3D printing, it's hours and hours of 3D printing. And then I get to come in with my hands again and actually piece it all together with my 3D pen. And once that seam is complete, it retains the flexibility across the seam because I'm only connecting it where there's already material printed. So I get to control that flexibility in the beginning of my process. I, I get to keep the control at the design level when I'm creating it in Fusion 360. And I'm not um, bound by the, the additional process of introducing a sewn seam there later on. So this is me trying on just the top. So I'm getting a lot of weight in this garment now that this is all being put together. And initially I wanted the garment to be one entire piece from top to bottom, um, but I've decided that I'm gonna break it up to, into a top and a skirt because I don't want the entire weight of the entire piece to be hanging off of the shoulders. It's just a lot to ask of this flimsy mesh material that I'm printing on. Um, so I'm making that sort of design change at this you know, end, end of the process. But I think, I think it's wise. The, this is about two and a half, almost three spools of, um, of filament. And uh, the weight of that escapes me right now, but just trust me, it's a lot. It feels like, when I put it on, it feels like wearing an incredibly dense sequined gown or, you know, chain mail or something. It's really, it's, it really adds up the plastic. Here's some details of the skirt. And this is kind of a look at the inside. So I'm printing on a very, very flat surface. I'm printing on a mirror surface on my 3D printer and it, it is so flat that it actually creates this very reflective underside to the print. So I might come back and work with that in a future project. It ends up looking a bit like a sequin. It's, it's really beautiful, especially with this filament. And that's the, that's the dress so far. It's almost complete. I just need to figure out how to get a zipper in there. Um, it's, it's wrapping up some loose ends and I always feel like um, you know, the last 10% of the project is the hardest to get through because you're just exhausted and a little burnt out. But um, I'm excited to get this done and actually be able to, to wear the entire thing. So if you want to know more about the things that I do and some of the things I've talked about, I did, um, I was on Tested, Adam Savage is Tested, talking with Norm Chan about some of my wearable projects and there's some demos in there of some of the things I've built. Um, I wrote an article for Make Magazine about the laser cutting portion of my space suit. That's, I believe, June 2018, or you can find it on their website. And I also wrote an article, a tutorial about the LED jacket and the um, putting the lights in my helmet. And those are in my book, which is called Wearable Tech Projects. It's a whole bunch of projects in there. Some of the other things that I showed you are in there as well. Um, and you can get it at that really long URL or you can visit my website and I have a link to it. And this is where you can find me on the web. And that's all I've got. Um, thanks for listening to all of that. I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them. Wow, thank you so much, Sophie, for sharing your work. That was, that was really amazing and um, super cool to see the process. So thank you, thank you again. Oh, thank you. Um, let's see here. Let's scroll into here and see what we have. Um, Ginger wanted to know a little bit more about the fan setup for your spacesuit and was asking, um, did this come from somewhere else or did you figure it out within the build? Uh, so the fan in the spacesuit, let me go grab it. One sec. Okay.
So we're in luck because um, I actually ended up sending that spacesuit out to a music video shoot. So it was just used in a music video, which is pretty exciting for me. Um, they shot the video in the Badlands and it was a, a kind of a brutal shoot. Uh, the actress was scrambling all over hills and sand and stuff. And anyway, uh, it came back with a little bit of damage. But, um, but that's great because I can show you what the fan looks like inside because the box broke apart. But basically, um, it didn't come from anywhere except that I know that there are other people who, who build um, comfort mechanisms into their costumes, like a lot of the people who create fur suits and uh, larger mascot costumes and stuff like that. And in theater, we're always trying to think of how to um, keep the actor comfortable and cool and allow them to do their performance. So um, there are lots of different tricks, tips and tricks out there. Um, but I wanted to um, stay within the visual scale of what I'd already designed for the suit. So um, I had this idea that if I put a utility belt on the space suit, then I could really throw any, any kind of equipment on the belt and it would look like miscellaneous like space exploration equipment. So uh, this is a look at the, so this is the actual belt. And let me just grab it. There's a lot of harnessing on it as well because I feel like harnesses really, really sell a spacesuit. So this is the, the USB battery packs that I chose. I could have gone with just one larger one, but I like the visual look of multiples. Um, and these are just USB batteries, battery packs, so you could charge your phone. So what's great is when I'm wearing this at a convention, if I have to charge my phone, I just plug it into my costume. Um, or, you know, anyone else needs a charge, they just plug into my costume. It's kind of fun. And here is the, here is the fan box. The fan box is made out of plastic, and it's got a computer fan in it. It's really simple. It's got a switch on the side. And then this, this is the, um, the, the port that the air goes through. And I have this 3D printed part. And actually, I need to give credit to my husband for, for this. We drew up the design together, but I was so slammed on time. I was like, can you just 3D print this for me? And he put this all together and it's great. So this fits in here and it channels the, the air up through this tube and this slides into the backpack. It's really hidden inside the backpack. And then my helmet comes over and I have another little connector that I can direct the air uh, to the front, blowing across the, the front of the helmet. So it's a really simple mechanism. Um, and what I really like about it is because I made this so modular, and there's so much room left on my, uh, my belt. I can add another one. I think I wanna add another fan um, to get even more airflow uh, because as comfortable as I was in the last convention I went to, that was in February a couple of years ago. And if I went to anything that was warmer than Seattle in February, <laughs> uh, I would need another fan. So um, I do have some more plans for this, but that's basically how the fan works. Wow. Cool, that's, that's pretty sweet. Um, Mark wanted to know a little bit more about uh, 3D printing on top of the fabric. So was the fabric just laid out on the bed or you know, can you quickly tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so it's a great process. So um, essentially the way you 3D print, the way you 3D print on fabric is you lay down the first layer of your print. So 3D print is composed of multiple layers building up from the bottom. So usually when you print a regular 3D print, you just print the whole thing and you take it off the bed and you have an object. But when you want to 3D print on fabric, you want to lay down that first layer and then pause your print. And you can either do that in the slicing software, you can do it manually. It's best to program that in, in the slicing software. So you print the first layer, it pauses, then you lay a piece of fabric on top of that first layer and I tape it down on all four sides so it's really well adhered to the bed. Then you resume your print 
and the rest of the print finishes on top of the fabric and you're essentially sandwiching the fabric between the first two layers of the print. So if I grab my sample again, you can see, maybe you can see that it's shiny where these plastic pieces are. Um, and you can kind of see the mesh pattern coming through there, but there's one layer of plastic on this side and then like, I don't know, maybe 20 layers on this side. And uh, people always ask me what kind of material I'm printing on. This is nylon mesh fabric. It's also known as tulle. It's the kind of material that uh, ballerina tutus are made out of or uh, foofy prom dress petticoats. Um, you can get that at Joann's. It's a pretty common material to find in fabric stores. Um, and it comes in different, you can get either a really wide mesh pattern, like this is kind of wide, or you can get a very tiny, tight mesh pattern. And um, that just affects how large of a shape you can print on top of it or how spaced out they can be. All of those are factors in the kind of material uh, quality you get, the properties of the material when it's done. So I actually just had a lot of fun going through that experimentation process and trying different materials, different shapes, different distances. Um, and there's, like I said, there are a lot of other people experimenting with this and everyone's discovering a new kind of um, property that you can get out of this process. It's super, super interesting. Yeah, that's cool. It's a, and it's a good segue into kind of maybe telling us a little bit more about the types of 3D printers and laser cutters and things that you use. I think I saw you use like a, a Glowforge. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, so I have, um, so yeah, my, my laser cutter is a Glowforge and it's, it's fantastic for what I do. It's really um, uh, simple to use. I have a Glowforge Basic. You know, they also make a pro version. <clears throat> it's a little bit bigger, I think. Um, the basic one is great for me. It's, it's a great size. It's really easy to use. I didn't go straight to that. Um, I, my husband and I spent some time on another laser cutter that was at a makerspace first. So we had access to this makerspace. We did a couple of projects on that uh, epilogue laser cutter. Um, there's a little bit, um, it requires a little bit more um, uh, knowledge and expertise to use, I would say. The Glowforge is really easy to just jump in and start using, um, but we, I think it was really beneficial to spend some time on that other laser cutter that taught us about um, conceptually how to set up your work properly so that you can get a good result out of the laser cutter. Uh, but yeah, I use the, the Glowforge for foam, for acrylic, for cardboard. I do a lot of prototyping on it. Um, it's so Fast. So what's interesting is I started with 3D printing before laser cutting and laser cutting is so much faster than 3D printing. It is like when you move from a 3D printer to a laser cutter, you're like, what do you mean this will be done in 20 seconds or 90 seconds? You know, um, you're used to just 3D printing something for like eight hours or 12 hours or two days or something ridiculous like that. So so I like having both of those in my arsenal. Um, they're useful for different things. Um, my 3D printer, I actually now have two large format 3D printers. Uh, one of them is a Creality CR10S. It's a workhorse. It's really um, stable, really dependable. It's not great as a beginner machine, I would say, um, but I, previously had a MakerBot. We, we got into 3D printing in 2013. Um, so that is pretty early. And the MakerBot that we got um, was a very early machine and it served us well for a while. But uh, like I said, we, we learned the basics on that machine and then we were really well prepared to take on the CR10 when we got it. <clears throat> now I also have, oh, and I should say these are FDM printers. So these are printers that take plastic filament. I don't have a resin printer. That's another type of 3D printing that is really popular right now. I'm doing all FDM printing, uh, mostly with PLA. And my second 3D printer that I just got is a Sidewinder. It's made by Artillery. 
And it is a, um, it's a little bit different than the CR10. The CR10 is what's known as a Bowden style 3D printer. So um, if you guys are industrial designers, you'll be interested in this. The Bowden style 3D printer is, uh, it has the extrusion motors are located um, on the actual uh, stationary portion of the machine. And then there's a tube pushing the material to the extruder head. So the extruder head is pretty light, it can move around quickly, and um, all of the, the heavy duty motoring is off to the side. The sidewinder that I got is what's known as a direct drive printer. The motors are mounted on the extrusion assembly head. So they move around with the extruder. Um, it's a trade-off because it then becomes heavier, it's a little more jerky, but it's easier to print flexible material. Um, and I'm really excited to do more experiments with flexible materials like TPU. Uh, so, and that machine is really fast. It's faster to heat up than my CR10. It's quiet. Um, it's, it's, and the difference between them is maybe like three years development. I got the CR10 maybe two or three years before <clears throat> getting the, the Sidewinder. So this technology is just developing so fast and it's, it's really addicting to, to get into this stuff and learn about it. I just love it. Oh yeah, for sure. I remember, I think when MakerBot, I think they had like a Kickstarter or something several years ago, right? And then I remember looking at the price and I was like, what? That is so, you know, still like several thousand dollars, but it was still like yeah. accessible, right? And now it's, it's like a few it's hundred like, dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I will never, ever, I will never throw away my MakerBot because it was like, it was like two and a half thousand dollars. Right. It was crazy. Like I right. couldn't, believe, I was like, what are we doing? Spending <laughs> this money on this thing that, you know, hardly anyone has ever heard of. And yeah. now it's like, you know, the Sidewinder that I just got was like less than $500, mm -hmm. you know? And it's just crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Um, Pat wanted to ask, have you considered building an inner support for the dress with uh, waist tape and boning to transfer the weight from the shoulders to the waist? Yes, yes, Pat, you're reading my mind. So I'm doing a waist stay. And I'm doing some, uh, so for people who are not familiar with um, garment design, a waist stay is a non-stretch um, piece of material. It's usually a bias tape or something that can go around your waist and anchor the weight of the garment to your waist. So the places that you want, and this is actually really uh, valuable information if you're creating any kind of wearable, uh, because once you put a battery in anything, you have to deal with weight and balancing that weight. Uh, and the best place to anchor weight is to your waist and uh, to keep it close to your body so that um, it moves with you, essentially. So yes, I'm going to add a waist stay into the lining of the dress and, uh, and then anchor that to the shoulders. It's similar to what I'm doing in the harnessing for my spacesuit. Uh, I also recently did a robot, robot jetpack suit for another music video and there's harnessing on that as well and I use the same concept of anchoring the weight to the waist and stabilizing it across the shoulders um, so yes that is exactly what I'm doing on the on the inside of the garment so it's kind of interesting for this 3d printed dress um, the the functional aspect of it is really going to be the the um, the inner workings that are all going to be made out of fabric to actually support this and pull this off and make it look like a, an effortless um, piece of 3D printed material on the outside. So it'll be interesting, like there's so many secrets in this dress that you won't be able to see from the outside. So many pieces put together. My cat is meowing, I don't know if you can hear her. Um, the uh, so many pieces put together, um, but they're all going to look like one piece. And, um, and then all of that, all of the secret dressmaker tricks that'll be on the inside that make it actually wearable and like stay on your body and open and closable. So that's where the magic is going to be. Wow. That's cool. Very cool. So I think let's have, let's ask one more question um, before we wrap up. And that's like, what's next? What, what are you thinking about doing next? 
Oh my gosh, I have so many ideas. And um, I actually, I wanna do some more work with this 3D printing on fabric. I wanna try creating some stretch. Um, I wanna print on some stretch material. So this material, this mesh material, there's no stretch in it um, just natively, but I, I know um, people have had success printing on some very thin um, stretch it's like the kind of material that's used in foundation garments. So um, like power mesh. Um, and I'm really, really interested in figuring out how to combine those material properties together. So I wanna do more work there. Um, <clears throat> and my whole goal when I started this project was not just to have a 3D printed garment, but I wanted to have electronics in it as well. So that kind of fell out of the process when I realized that I had so much work to do to get through the experimentation phase and, and really just learn all of the, all of the um, limitations of using this material to create a full piece like this. I realized I had to let go of the electronics um, and just really learn about the material and its properties. So now I feel like I've got a handle on that and I think my next version of this is going to have some electronics in it, maybe some lights, maybe some interactive um, sensor driven mechanics. So yeah, the, the ideas are there. I, I just, I need the time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, when it takes, you know, a day or so to print, right? it takes, takes time. So Wow. Well, great. Thank you so much, Sophie, for sharing your work and talking about your process. It was really informative and uh, I, I, we all really enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, thank you again and thank you everyone else for, for joining. So, yeah. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, thanks to everyone for listening. I really, really enjoyed doing this. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, everyone. Thanks again. And uh, we'll see you at our next event. Thanks, Sophie.